internship and data rights is uh, it's very important uh, in building a responsible data economy where we actually help users to maintain control of their data and their rights to data. When user provides their data, the user essentially loses control of uh, his or her data because the data consumer now with a raw copy of user's data can essentially do anything that he or she wants because once user's data is being copied, the user no longer can no longer control how his or her data is being utilized. Do me a favor, picture your favorite crypto app or exchange. Got it? Now I have five questions for you. Question number one, does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees? Question number two, does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms? Question number three, does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates, best liquidity, but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book? Question number four, is your favorite app or exchange Swiss made, but also licensed and regulated in the EU so that you can feel 100% reassured, but also sleep well at night? Question number five, is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values, 100% community-centric and not VC-backed? So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the SwissBorg Wealth app, join the New Era Wealth Management, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Don Song, CEO and co-founder of Oasis Labs, but also professor of engineering and computer science at Berkeley, and someone who really can see it not only from a research standpoint, from an academic standpoint, but give us feedback from the students, the youth that will help us scale and build this Finance 2.0 that we're looking forward to. Today, we're going to talk about some amazing topics such as scalability, privacy, data ownership, including DeFi 2.0, and how we'll be able to do data yielding in the future to really make this an inclusive economy for all. So don't forget to stay tuned all the way to the very end. And without further ado, Professor Don Song, it's such a pleasure to have you today. How are you doing? Great. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And the first question I'd love to ask you, Professor, is basically, you know, since you have hands-on experience with the students, and we know that this whole blockchain and cryptocurrency space really is a generational shift, right? We know that these are the people who will help us scale the technology as we're building the infrastructure. But I would love to ask you, what is the sentiment these days amongst your students? What are the stories? How are they feeling about this whole blockchain phenomenon? Uh, I think yeah, blockchain remains to be uh, you know, an exciting area for the students. Uh, I have been actually teaching blockchain class uh, you know, even earlier. Uh, I would say during the, um, uh, the last boom, 2017-2018 uh, time, I would say at the time when I offered blockchain class, it was uh, like standing room only and uh, we um, so the, the class was fully packed and, and so on um, and uh, since then I think um, uh, so some students are still interested um, I, I think as a, as a technology blockchain is a fascinating field uh, so we continue to see students interest uh, but I think it definitely um, for, for, like, for other students uh, in terms of space, 
uh, it's interesting the market actually does have some impact uh, on the level of interest from the students as well, which is not too surprising. That's fantastic. It's it's great to hear that the youth is is into this thing. It wasn't just a like a hype back in 2017, but people are still studying and that you're teaching. We need amazing professors like you teaching this to the youth so that they can obviously help us in the future. But personally for you, like a professor, like you not only understand blockchain, you understand security, you understand deep learning, you understand machine learning, many, many fields in the tech space. Uh, which technology do you feel is the most interesting for you? Is it more machine learning? Is it more blockchain and why? Um, that's, that's a very good question. I would say oftentimes, you know, these fields, they also do come together. Uh, so oftentimes at the intersection of these fields is, I think, the most uh, where uh, some of the most exciting things happen. Uh, so for example, oftentimes my work actually happens at, at the intersection of security and privacy, blockchain, and machine learning, you know, intersections of, uh, you know, some of these fields. And uh, so, for example, uh, uh, like AI, the intersection of AI and security and AI and privacy, and also like security and blockchain, of course. Like, I actually view blockchain as part of uh, security fields. Most of the blockchain, uh, you know, the core technology actually are all from security. Uh, of course, a lot of interesting things coming from economics and incentives and so on as well. Um, and also, uh, at the interesting, like blockchain, uh, for example, some of the work that we have been doing at Oasis actually utilizes blockchain uh, in conjunction with secure computing and so on that can help solve some of the challenging problems in machine learning as well, in particular, to help solve the data problem, how to make sure that you can get data and have, and at the same time to protect the privacy of data and also ensuring that, for example, as you treat machine learning models, uh, the, the value created by the models can also be distributed back to uh, data contributors in a fair way. So these are all very interesting cutting edge questions. Oh, fascinating answer. And you just mentioned some really important topics such as security and data privacy. I'd love to ask you a question related to security. Actually, two questions. Number one, is blockchain really, is that security really one of the main factors or one of the appealing points to you when it comes to, you know, its use case? And also, are you concerned about some of the smart contracts uh, code and security at the moment we see in DeFi, there are many, many issues in this world. If you could let us know, yeah, from a blockchain standpoint and also the DeFi smart contract standpoint, that'd be really interesting. Right, of course. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Of course, security, I would say, is one of the most important uh, expert, aspects in blockchain and smart contracts. I and mean, the whole point of blockchain, uh, in particular in this permissionless setting, is that how do you have these uh, distributed, mutually distrusted uh, entities coming together to maintain this immutable ledger, to uh, to reach consensus and all that. And given that um, you know a certain fraction of the entities may misbehave and so on, so having a secure uh, consensus protocol and making sure that the system can be secure even when a certain fraction of the uh, of the nodes or the entities. Uh, are malicious is uh, of course really important, and this is a topic that has been um, has been researched for for decades uh, in the in the research community. And uh, in terms of smart contracts, also yes, especially given that uh, you know the for example these DeFi financial instruments, uh, so much money actually can be locked in these smart contracts, and if you have uh, bugs in these smart contracts, it can really have uh, dire consequences as what we have witnessed uh, uh, right <laughs> in a number of ex examples including Yam and so on um, so so yeah it's interesting again for the smart contract uh, security it's also a, a, you know it's a question that the research community has been um, uh, has been exploring for a very long time and you know, there are a lot of uh, program analysis techniques and tools that people have developed in the past. Um, similar principles uh, and techniques, they apply uh, in a smart contract domain uh, as well. 
Very cool. So, Professor, I was watching a video of you the other day, and you were talking about security vulnerabilities in the code, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and potential malicious attacks. And some people ask about whether quantum computing will be a threat and could create malicious attacks to blockchain security. Is that a concern of yours? Uh, certainly, um, for the future, we would like, for example, the blockchain solution to be quantum uh, resistant and so on. And uh, it's yes, it's good to build uh, strong uh, security solutions that can be resilient against attacks in the future as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And I want to ask you about privacy. I know you're a big advocate of having privacy in blockchain. Do you mind telling us why privacy is so important to you and, and what you're working on these days to help this specific uh, category? As well, no, data is a key driver for modern economy. And a lot of this data is really sensitive and handling sensitive data has posed many challenges for both uh, users and uh, businesses. Uh, so for users, we continue to see that users are losing control of their data, and they don't really know how their data has been used, and they oftentimes don't even know when their data was collected, and what, uh, what type of data has been collected uh, from them, and, uh, and so on. And also, users are not uh, getting sufficient direct benefits from their data as well. And on the business side, we uh, continue to see uh, businesses are suffering from large-scale security breaches. So even when businesses want to have the good intention to take good care of users' data, uh, oftentimes they don't have the sufficient uh, te technologies and tools to help them. And also with the uh, the wider adoption uh, of uh, and deployment of uh, the privacy regulations such as uh, GDPR and CCPA, it's becoming more and more cumbersome and expensive for uh, these um, uh, uh, for businesses to comply with these uh, privacy regulations also. And more importantly, it's uh, still really difficult for businesses to utilize data. Oftentimes, valuable data is locked in data silos and um, uh, due, to, uh, due to privacy uh, concerns and so on. And so providing the needed uh, technologies to help businesses to break uh, these data silos, to help businesses to utilize uh, the sensitive information in a privacy preserving way in a responsible way will really help um, uh, help the data uh, to be better utilized and we hope that it can also help bring a win-win situation between users and businesses. And that's very interesting and so this whole role of privacy is that mainly linked to data ownership uh, on top of the private transactions is that how you see privacy playing the biggest uh, contributing as, as its main role? So, um, yeah, data ownership and data rights, it's, uh, it's very important uh, in building a responsible data economy where we actually help users to maintain control of their data and their rights to data. And in order to do this, and it's important that as data is being utilized, we protect the privacy of users' data. And on one hand, it's uh, so that user sensitive data is not being leaked. On the other hand, also it's really important to help users to maintain control of their rights to data. So for example, in today's um, paradigm, for example, in today's data marketplace, when user uh, provides their data, the, the consumer of the data actually gets a raw copy of user's data. So that in this case, when the consumer of the data gets a raw copy of the data, then the, the, data, the user essentially loses control of uh, his or her data because the data consumer now with a raw copy of user's data can essentially do anything that he or she wants. And hence, in such a paradigm, it's not really possible to actually um, enforce data ownership 
our users' data rights. Because once uh, user's data is being copied, the user no longer can no longer control how his or her data is being utilized. So that's why in the Oasis platform, we uh, again uh, by utilizing secure computing uh, and uh, combining the secure computing with the the blockchain ledger platform, we enable an entirely new paradigm, a new framework. In this case, the Blockchain Ledger can help provide an immutable uh, log of users' rights to data, and uh, and the secure computing environment ensures that when uh, data consumers use the data, the data uh, is only accessed inside the secure execution environment. So the computing can only happen inside the secure execution environment, and once the um, uh, so once the computation is uh, is done, the data consumer actually does not retain a copy of the user's raw data, and uh, in in this way, uh, this approach helps users to um, maintain uh, control of his or her data and uh, rights to data, while still enable the data to be utilized in a privacy preserving way. That's really cool. And I heard from the Oasis Labs that, you know, kind of the way you guys see data ownership, it's almost like a DeFi 2.0, right? Where people will have data yielding, for instance, right? In the future of DeFi, where it's not just, you know, investing your money, but actually earning money through data ownership and, and things like that. Do you mind elaborating on that? Because that seems like, number one, a fascinating topic, but also it seems like an even more interesting system for everyone to really be included in this finance 2.0. So um, yeah, data is really valuable, and also in the future, more and more data will be uh, uh, more and more data will be collected um, about users and so on, and also more and more of uh, what defines a user actually will be in the digital world. Essentially, users' data actually uh, will define more uh, who the user is, and also can become a more uh, valuable part uh, of the user's asset. And hence, it's important to actually help users to gain benefits from their data, but of course, in a privacy-preserving way and in a responsible way. And so in today's DeFi, uh, people are familiar with the liquidity farming and liquidity yield concept where users provide uh, liquidity and uh, essentially, for example, their token assets and so on uh, in a liquidity pool so that for either for lending or for, um, uh, for DEX, uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, and so on. And in return, users get a yield. Um, but in this case, you can only get a yield if you have money, and the more money you have, the more liquidity you provide, the higher yield you get. So what we would like to see is that we actually want to help um, in the general population who may not have much money, um, but they have their data, and we want to help these users to, uh, to gain a better benefits from their data. And also, we hope that this is a better way to help break down the silos and to make it easier for digital consumers to gain access and utilize the valuable data. For example, uh, for health data, uh, for, uh, for medical research, and so on. So, so in this case, we have a concept uh, for data yield. So instead of a liquidity yield, in this case, users could do data staking. They could stake their data in, for example, a data pool that we call Data Trust, and um, and users can um, also specify policies how they want their data to be utilized. And now, when a data consumer utilizes users' data, or utilizes data in this Data Trust, the data consumer can pay into the Data Trust, which can later on distribute uh, the benefits uh, to the user uh, in different forms. And 
um, I think uh, this can really help grow the uh, the current DeFi uh, into a much bigger scale. Since, as we know, data economy is much bigger scale uh, than just the traditional financial domain. And I think it'll be really exciting to see how uh, we can help users to maintain control of their data and the rest of data, and at the same time to really help users to utilize their own data to gain more benefits to themselves. Either it's a better monetary uh, uh, return or better services and so on. So Professor, let's say the viewers out there want to tokenize their data today or right away. How far are we from this and where should we start? Oh, we are actually pretty close from the uh, Oasis platform. Essentially, um, you can almost, uh, we can almost uh, uh, start uh, getting started uh, uh, yeah, very, very soon. So, so I can also mention some uh, current uh, use cases where we, um, so this is in the area of uh, genomic uh, data domain. Uh, so in partnership with uh, another genomic company, uh, we um, uh, uh, we are building a product and service. And when this launches, this will be the first time where users become owners of their uh, genomic data. So in this case, uh, users' genomic data is stored in encrypted form, and users can specify the policies how they want their data to be utilized. For example, they can and give consent um, to allow this genomic company to utilize users' data uh, to run genomic analysis over their data and produce results uh, and reports to the user. And in this case, the analysis will happen inside our secure execution environment. So through this uh, approach, essentially, we uh, help users to tokenize their genomic data so users now be, uh, become owners of their genomic data and also at the same time uh, enable the genomic data to be utilized in a privacy-preserving way. And users can also then, for example, allow medical researchers to get access to their data and utilize their data in a privacy-preserving way uh, and also potentially contribute to, uh, uh, to certain use cases by pharmaceutical companies and in return uh, get a certain monetary reward as well. And this is one example of how users can actually tokenize their genomic data as we launch uh, this product and service. And, um, and there are also uh, many other types of uh, product and services that the users can uh, then uh, later utilize to help tokenize other types of data, such as their financial data, uh, and IoT data and so on. Thank you so much for that, Professor. So we talked about security, we talked about privacy. If you don't mind, I'd love to move to scalability because I know you've been active in doing research in this specific field. As you know, we have the third generation blockchains such as Polkadot, such as Elrond, such as Cardano, et cetera, et cetera, that could be a threat to Ethereum. But what is your take in terms of scalability? Are we getting there? How is the progress so far? So we can need to see scalability as a key uh, bottleneck for today's blockchain platform. So for example, on Ethereum a platform, they, uh, the gas fee has been uh, really high. It's really at uh, a state where uh, it hinders uh, normal transactions on the blockchain platform. And as we continue to see the growth of applications on these blockchain platforms, it's uh, really important that we uh, build new solutions to address these challenges. That's fascinating and, and I'm really excited to see this, this paradigm in action. Like, it, it, How would you explain this, by the way, a professor, to my grandma Susie, if she was watching the, the show? What is the simplest way to talk about paradigm and the technology behind it? and uh, if you can simplify it as easily as possible, that'd be amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, Oasis platform actually uh, has a completely new architecture, and this new architecture uh, brings 
uh, and much better scalability uh, capabilities for the Oasis platform. And we achieve this through uh, what we call this paradigm architecture. So first, let me talk a little bit about why today's blockchain platform, uh, such as uh, Ethereum, uh, suffers from the scalability issues. So in a blockchain, one needs to accomplish three main functions. One is consensus, how different nodes come to reach agreements. And two, compute, how to do smart contract execution and storage to store a smart contract state and so on. So, uh, so today's blockchain bundles these three functions together and hence uh, it's very easy to reach bottleneck if uh, any of these functions uh, reaches a bottleneck. So uh, in, uh, in the OSIS platform, what we uh, enable is uh, this separation of execution from consensus. So that we actually put, the architecture has several layers. And uh, at, at the bottom is the consensus layer where we use proof of stake and different uh, nodes can participate uh, uh, in the consensus layer uh, to enable this proof of uh, consensus. And then on top of that, we have a layer that we call paradigm layer, which handles the compute and storage. So with this paradigm layer, we uh, enable parallel execution, uh, where uh, the paradigm layer can uh, consist of Different uh, uh, different paradigms concurrently. So each paradigm uh, is uh, uh, essentially can be viewed as a sub network where you have a a, a paradigm committee that were dyna dynamically selected um, uh, if, uh, to form this paradigm committee, and then they run um, a paradigm engine. Uh, inside uh, this paradigm. And uh, different paradigms can run different paradigm engines. So these paradigm engines, uh, when we do think of them as essentially they are a runtime, like a, like a VM. And in fact, we, one of the paradigm engines and the OSIS platform supports is um, fully backwards compatible to Ethereum EVM. And hence, it's really easy for Solidity developers to simply run their Solidity smart contracts uh, on OSIS platform through this EVM compatible paradigm. And so, so now I talked about what is one paradigm, which is composed of the paradigm committee, uh, which is uh, dynamically selected nodes to run um, the, a paradigm engine and to essentially execute uh, the smart contract executions. And, and these different paradigms, they can run concurrently uh, and hence allows easy parallel execution. And, um, and also, uh, the paradigm is connected to the consensus layer uh, in, a, in a, a novel way uh, through a verifiable computing approach uh, that we call discrepancy detection. So within each paradigm, um, when the different uh, nodes in the paradigm committee uh, executes, they will execute the same uh, set of smart contract transactions. And uh, as long as one paradigm node is honest, the consensus layer can detect any misbehavior through detecting discrepancy among the results reported by uh, each of the paradigm committee nodes to the consensus layer. And through this way, the misbehaving paradigm nodes uh, will be slashed. Uh, they, need to be, uh, they need to stake first to be uh, a node in the paradigm. And if they misbehave, uh, their stake will be slashed. So through this way, through this discrepancy detection, the paradigm uh, uh, right, so, 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 so this way, uh, for a paradigm to achieve the same level of security, it actually um, only need to have F plus one nodes 
uh, where f is a number of uh, potentially dishonest nodes. And hence, uh, this approach actually provides much better efficiency than sharding and perishing in polka dot uh, uh, while achieving the same level of security. And in this way, the OSIS um, paradigm architecture actually can achieve uh, even greater uh, scalability uh, than some of the other, uh, the other designs. That's fascinating. That's really, really cool. So it's scalability. It's also for interoperability across multiple blockchains and it executes multiple, ex uh, it has multiple executions across different programming languages. Is that how, in, in a nutshell or? <laughs> right, so Paratime Engine is a VM uh, that uh, you can use as, uh, as a VM uh, a runtime that runs inside a Paratime. And again, the OSIS platform one of the advantages in this architecture is that it can really um, naturally support heterogeneous uh, paradigm engines, as I already mentioned. One of the paradigm engines is fully backwards compatible to Ethereum EVM. We also have a paradigm engine that supports Rust as a, uh, as a smart contract language. And we also have paradigm engines where the nodes have uh, secure hardware, and the Paratime engines allows confidential smart contracts to be executed uh, inside the secure hardware. That sounds really, really cool. And I must ask you, Professor, like a question related to the blockchain trilemma. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of people are talking about this as a topic in terms of limitations, but you just mentioned like Paratime's second layer solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So do you still see, see the blockchain trilemma? So having to choose between decentralization, scalability, and security, and compromise on one another still an issue? Or do these second layer solutions actually can help us you know, get the all sides of the spectrum? I think we continue to push forward the frontier in the blockchain architecture and, uh, and technology design. So the goal is, uh, while well, ensuring uh, decentralization and security, how we can better provide scalability solutions. And um, as I mentioned, uh, with the OSIS uh, network architecture, while we maintain the same level of decentralization and security, we can enable greater scalability and hence, I think there are lots of interesting design points that we can explore uh, to essentially um, right, uh, provide better solutions um, uh, given, uh, uh, right, given the same level of decentralization and security. Very cool. Professor Don Song, you know, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. You know, I think it's not only important that you're providing great research, but also educating the youth, which to me is even cooler than that. Uh, if we want to follow you, Professor, like where are the best outlets to find you? Are you more, more active on Twitter these days? Are you more on LinkedIn? Uh, so my Twitter handle is Don Song Tweets. Uh, and... Uh, 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 right, so people can follow me there. Awesome. You guys heard it. We talked about privacy, security, scalability, the third generation blockchains, data yielding, which could be the DeFi 2.0, and many other exciting topics. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so you can get access to more of these timeless interviews with the best crypto educators in the space. Thank you so much for watching. See you next Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock BST. Thank you so much, guys.